Good morning, students. Um, I want to talk to you about the ending of Persuasion, which, as I read this wonderful novel again, only reiterates to me how brilliant Jane Austen is. You know, I'm actually a lover of Charlotte Bronte's work, and the work couldn't be more different, but I do respect and admire and am astonished by Jane Austen's writing. That is not to say that the ending of Persuasion isn't dreadful. <laughs> what I mean by that is, though, that uh, it seems to me in reading her other novels as well that Jane Austen doesn't know how to actually create romance when the, when the lovers finally can speak to each other the truth of their love for each other. It's just sort of uh, she goes on and on with plot. She goes on and on with exposition from Mrs. Smith about Mr. Elliot, which opens the way for uh, Anne to love uh, uh, Wentworth fully. So I would suggest that the ending is full of exposition. It's full of plot points. There's so much information being thrown at us, and we lose feeling in some ways, except for chapter 23, which is absolutely brilliant, and which is almost like a sex scene uh, for uh, 18th century readers who couldn't get pornography in the mainstream. Um, they had to get it underground behind the scenes. There was plenty of it, but not in the mainstream novel. But I would suggest to you that Jane Austen is uh, brilliant in how she is able to show in that one chapter everything that needs to be said about the fruition of this love affair. So I've suggested that it is kind of like a sex scene, uh, this in, in the way that an 18th century novel can give us a sex scene. And I also want to suggest in the same light that it is very much like the Gothic novels, chapter 23, that uh, Jane Austen makes fun of. Uh, and she's using the language of the, the Gothic novel. Uh, Anne and Wentworth are pierced, they're penetrated, they're agitated, and they're overcome by feelings in each moment. They're confused. Uh, Anne repeatedly can't think. She's confused. She has to leave the place because of the buzz going on around her. There's noise going on around her, but she can't compute the words that are going on around her because she is so agitated with feeling. She feels nervous thrills, for example. Um, <clears throat> so the Gothic novel is well known for uh, helping to bring forward repressed sexual uh, feelings and emotions. Well, so what is the arc of the chapter? We have Wentworth sitting at a desk writing. We don't know what he's writing, but Obviously, he's overwhelmed by something. He's overwhelmed by emotion. So he's got the pen in his hand. And in the meantime, Anne is nearby talking with Mr. Harville. And what are they talking about? It is the old battle of the sexes. Which gender is the more superior gender? Especially when it comes to love. And we have all these arguments about you know, are men and women constructed, or is it nature that creates the gender roles? That women are better at love uh, and gentleness than men are. Men are better at uh, intensity of feeling. All these uh, questions come up. But we have two moments that I think are very uh, key and important and symbolic. And that is when uh, both times that Wentworth stops writing. And, it, and, and uh, Jane Austen refers to it as his pen stops. And there is a, a sense that history is being made here. A revolution is occurring in that it is Anne's moment to speak. 
and Anne's moment to speak the history or her story of women. And so when Harville says, well, there's all kinds of stories and books about the inconstancy of women, and she says, no more of your books. No more of men's pen when describing women. Let us have the voices of women speak to us now. And Anne says, importantly, um, I am authorized to speak uh, about women and let me uh, voice, let me speak. And suddenly we have descriptions of Wentworth as full of feeling, as overwhelmed, as feeling penetrated by Anne. And the pen, uh, as uh, in a famous feminist statement by Gilbert and Rubar, is the penis uh, having, whoever gets to speak, whoever gets to write, has the power. Um, and at this moment, that power is being exchanged. And it's not that Anne is taking the power away from uh, Wentworth to write and to speak. He's stopping the writing. He's listening to her. He's being penetrated by her words and her looks. And it is as though they are penetrating each other with their deep and utter emotional respect and honor for each other. And at this point, um, it says, the re revolution which one instant had made in Anne was almost beyond expression. And as I suggest in the written lecture, yes, a revolution has occurred, and we're living in a time of revolution, right? The French Revolution, and I've made the argument that there are many revolutions going on in this time period. But there, there is also a, a larger revolution, not only in Anne's feelings and in their uh, Wentworth's and Anne's ability to love each other, but in Anne basically saying this is the model for future love, that a woman must be able to speak, she must be able to write, she must be able to take up the pen when it comes to speaking and uh, to uh, the authority to speak for women. And so when the letter that Wentworth has been writing unbeknownst to Anne, which is to her, when she finally gets it, she quote unquote devours it. Now that is not your genteel lady. That is a woman who is sexually alive. And it does say basically that at that point, Wentworth also comes to life. And I've been noting in the written lectures that this whole book is about Anne being restored to sexual life and bloom and beauty. And uh, a statement basically that she is worthy of all respect and honor. And at this point, Anne is so confused and overwhelmed by feelings that she recognized, and the feelings tell, the feelings are knowledge. The feelings tell her he loves her. They tell her that this is right, this is her due, and that the two of them will now be together and should be together. And that Lady Russell in particular, others who have tried to persuade her to the contrary, their uh, authority to speak for Anne and for her own feelings and for what is right for her life, no longer apply. And then we have a rather bland denouement uh, in which Jane Austen basically says, and then, you know, they were alone together and they repeated their vows to each other and we know that they're going to be in love with each other. Rather uh, bland, uh, stiff stuff compared to the range of emotions we've been feeling and the arc and the climaxes literally that we've been feeling throughout the rest of chapter 23. Now you notice there is an alternate ending. It was the first ending and uh, I would say about half of it is exactly the same as what you get in the final ending that we have, the final 
uh, brilliant chapter 23. Um, but it, the rest of it, it's, it's written in kind of a screenplay fashion. It's, uh, it's stilted, it's just plot point, it's uh, quick sentences, lots of capitalizations trying to get across the force of the feeling.